In this video, I'm going to be talking about a really highly requested subject here on my channel, and that is why do I wear this on the back of my head? I was pushing this video off a little bit because I wanted to have enough time to really delve into it and not just give a pat answer. I want to give a more in-depth explanation and explore different topics that kind of surround this subject. So first I'd kind of just like to cover the basics, the practice, why I do it, kind of the external appearance of everything. Then I'd like to also dive into this passage in the Bible and how different Christians interpret these verses differently. But most importantly, I would like this video to focus on the why and the teaching behind 1 Corinthians 11, which is the passage where we find these verses. They can definitely be very controversial, but I definitely want to dive into it because God's word is controversial, especially to the human flesh. However, I think this is a beautiful, beautiful passage. Not just this passage, but the topic in relating to this. Say questions like, what is God's calling for the Christian woman? What is her place in life? Things like submission, what does it actually mean? I'd also like to look a little bit at society's viewpoint on men and women and their roles and some of the things that society is feeding us that is not healthy and that we need to definitely look into God's word and make sure we're aligning ourselves with him and not with what people in society are telling us to think. And I'd also like to just touch a few points on Mennonite culture as well, um, some of the blessings and some of the downfalls um, surrounding this topic. Last of all, I'd like to do a disclaimer saying, just take everything that I am saying as my husband and I's viewpoint, not necessarily speaking for the entire Mennonite culture. So just view this video as my personal testimony as a Mennonite, but not necessarily that all other Mennonite groups would agree specifically with us. I will have time stamps and cards down in the description. You can go down in the description and see all the different things I'm covering. And also if you scroll along the bottom of the timeline, if you want to skip ahead, because this is going to be kind of a long chatty video that covers a, a range of things that all tie together. There's a lot in this that is going to be very controversial. And a lot of people might get offended. A lot of people might disagree with me and that's perfectly fine. I'm not trying to shove my viewpoints down anyone's throat. I'm just here telling you what I believe God's word says and how I apply it to my life. The thing that I find so ironic and it's sad to me, it's this whole woke culture. I don't see how people don't understand how toxic this is. This mindset that we're just going to shut down anyone's thoughts that doesn't agree with ours. Like here on this YouTube channel, I would just be making a video that to me has no controversial things in it whatsoever. And I might say or do something that just completely offended someone I never saw coming. And it doesn't really bother me. I actually find it rather amusing and I feel really sorry for these people. They will say, oh, I really liked watching your channel and your family, but you said this and now I can no longer follow you and I am leaving. Not that I mind, they can leave. I don't care if they watch or not. However, it's just such bondage they're in. And it's such a, I'm sorry, but it's just such a childish viewpoint. The thing that if you suddenly do not agree with someone, you're no longer their friend. If they have to agree with everything you agree with. And this just stifles free thinking. It stifles deep, meaningful conversation. It stifles the ability to expand your mind and think on new things and to be like, huh, I never thought of it from this perspective. I never thought of it from that perspective. No, I still don't agree with you, but it's an interesting thought. There's a saying I really like, it's, you were born an original, don't die a copy. And society's trying to make everybody a copy of each other. And you have to think a certain way, say things a certain way, you have to have all the political correct terms down pat. And my main takeaway is don't let society try to make you a copy. Life is so much better when there's diversity. That's what makes life beautiful. All right, number one, the practice of head covering. Um, where does this come from? Why do I do it? I would love to have Nolan on this video with me. He has an intellectual mind and a really incredible understanding of the Bible. And we want to do more videos, Bible faith-based together. However, he said on this subject, he said, this is your subject, you cover it. <laughs> it's kind of a woman's world. And sometimes it's just easier when one woman talks to another instead of a man talking something that kind of pertains to a woman. So um, I'm gonna be talking about this myself, but he and I both agree with all the points that I am putting down here. So I'm reading out of the King James Bible. There's various versions that are definitely a little bit easier to comprehend than the King James. We tend to use the King James, especially as our foundation Bible, because it's the most accurate interpretation of a word for word translation of the original Greek and Hebrew. I also have the NIV here, which tends to be more of a thought translation. So it's not quite as accurate, but it is definitely easier to read. So in 1 Corinthians 11, this is the only place in the whole Bible that we get this idea 
of um, covering for worship. 1 Corinthians 11, and we're gonna jump down to verse three. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, the woman is the glory of man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so the man also by the woman, by all things of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. I know the King James Version can definitely be a little bit archaic in the Old English and so on. So I'm going to read also out of the New American Standard Bible. So let's start once again, 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 3. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for it is one and the same as a woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, have her also cut her hair off. However, if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, have her cover her head. For a man should not have his head covered since he is in the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor man independent of woman. For as the woman originated from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge for yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does even nature itself not teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her as a covering. But if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor have the churches of God. There's kind of three viewpoints. Some Christians take the viewpoint, as I had said, where I believe it's a literal head covering. Some Christians take the viewpoint that no, it actually means long hair is a woman's covering. And the third viewpoint, um, would be that it's a cultural thing. It was something that Paul was teaching the Church of Corinth um, specifically for that era because I believe there was like a lot of temple prostitution going on. And the viewpoint is that Paul was teaching the women, you don't want to be mistaken as prostitutes, so you need to cover your head when we come to worship. Also, I'd like to mention as Mennonites, we do cover our head all the time. And it kind of comes from the thing of the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. And so if we're constantly praying, we should constantly have our head covered. There's definitely a viewpoint where a lot of people will practice this, but only in worship settings, only when they are around, say, other men that maybe aren't their husbands or their fathers. Um, so there's that viewpoint as well. And my husband and I would agree with that. My personal viewpoint on this passage is that, is that this is teaching a practice of an external literal covering that speaks of something else. And we'll talk more about the why behind that. This is a passage that is not easy to understand. It is something that people come out on different places with. I don't believe I have all the answers and I don't believe any Christian has all the answers. My husband and I talk about this. So often we see Christians desperately trying to come up with answers that they actually don't know. It's more of a strength than a person to admit that you know what? This confuses me as well. I believe the Bible. I believe the gospel. I believe Jesus Christ came to save my sins. I believe the whole gospel story. But there are parts of the Bible that are difficult to understand. There's parts that are black and white. Don't commit adultery. You know, don't lie. Don't steal. Don't cheat. All these things we know are sin. They're black and white. Then there's passages like this that can be a little bit more confusing. There's a lot of debate and theological discussion over it. I think we all just need to have an open heart 
and truly be open and ask God, is this what you're teaching me? And he will show us. Um, and I believe he's showing me that this is what I'm supposed to do. And I don't want to dive into this deeply, but there's some videos I highly recommend you watch if you're interested in this topic. There's a YouTube channel called The Head Covering Movement. It's about a pastor that was going through 1 Corinthians 11 and he came upon this and he just couldn't get around it. He was pretty sure this was talking about a literal head covering. And he took his congregation on a journey and it created this movement and a lot of people are joining it saying, you know what, we believe that this is teaching a literal interpretation, uh, something that we should be doing today. So links to that in the description, check out his YouTube channel. So when you read through this passage, it's talking about where your head is covered or if it's uncovered. And when you go back to the original, is it the Greek or the Hebrew, they all have the same root word. Throughout all these passages, until you get down to um, the passage where it says, for her hair is given her for a covering, and that covering is a completely different Greek word. And so the English translation took all these coverings and made it like as English does, we have the same words for different meanings at times and um, it made them all into covering. Whereas when Paul was teaching it, there was obviously two different Greek words going on here. Um, it would appear as if he is talking about a literal head covering. So let me just quickly insert here. The two Greek words found in these verses are kalupto, which is the majority of the verses. And then the last one where it's talking about where her hair is given to her for a covering, it's parabolian. So the word kalupto in Greek, the definition would be to hide, veil, or to hinder the knowledge of a thing. And then parabolian would be something thrown around one, a mantle, veil, covering, vesture. And so when we look at the original Greek words, everything seems to point to Paul talking about um, a literal covering. Let's just take all these uncovered and covered words, and if it's liter if it's talking about your long hair as the covering, then the rest of these verses would be irre irre irrelevant. So let's go ahead and just put in long hair instead of covered or uncovered in some of these passages. Basically would say, for if a woman does not have long hair, let her also have her hair cut off. For if a wife will not have long hair, then she should cut her hair short. Why would you say, for if a wife will not have long hair, then she should cut her hair short? I mean, that's just rewording everything. And so a few different things like that where I believe the original Greek is talking about a literal head covering and just the way this is worded about cutting your hair short, if you're not covered to me implies that it is not um, hair as a covering. Anyway, I've spent too much time on that. I just recommend going and checking out the channel. It's just my viewpoint. It's where I come out on these verses. But, and then the last point would be, is it a cultural thing? I believe that everything in the Bible is relevant for churches and people of all generations. And I think there's a practice here that if practiced by Christians today is something that you will be extremely blessed in in ways you did not previously understand you could be. So now that we have all that behind us, I wasn't really looking forward to just delving into it and dissecting it because it is a very controversial and hard to understand passage. And I can understand how people come out in different places. My thinking is just be open to God and God will show you what his will is for you. If you just have an open heart and this is my personal testimony, I believe this is calling us to wear an outward symbol of what more that this passage is teaching and what the Bible is calling for us women in life. And that's what I wanna talk more about and dive more deeply into. And it's more controversial and not so fun topics, but I think it's something that needs to be talked about. There is a word that is really hard for pretty much anyone to hear, and that is the word submission. To submit yourself to someone else. It's not easy to do, it goes against human flesh. It's something that just kinda of grinds against humanity because we don't want to submit we want to be the ones in control and in authority and it's not a fun topic to talk about especially when you look at it through a human perspective um, but it's actually very beautiful and if you'll stick with me i'll explain why and explain my thought process as well so when we read through first corinthians 11 especially in the king james king james is kind of a harsh abrupt language it just gets straight to the point and just says it how it is and it can kind of like irritate a little bit and I'll just go over some of the feelings us women can generate when we're going over these passages. Like down in verse 8, it says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Man wasn't created for woman. Woman was created for man. And that can immediately like kind of have this uprising feeling, especially in today's society, where we're like, what are we? You know, it kind of gives you this feeling that you're just there for a man's pleasure or a man's use and that's not what this is talking about. 
But then down in verse 11, it says, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman or the woman without the man in the Lord. In the New American whatever translation, it says here, however, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. It's saying that we both need each other very much. Like, we're a union, we complement each other. It's saying, in the Lord, we are equal. Going on with this thought process, Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all in Christ Jesus. And this is saying that everyone is equal on the playing field. There's no one that's more valuable or less valuable when we are in Christ's family. If you're a millionaire or if you're dirt poor, it makes no difference to Christ. It doesn't matter where you were born, what family you're in. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter any of that. We are all equally valued. This is how Jesus views us. And when we understand that, it's much easier to read verses like this in 1 Corinthians 11, where it's telling us what our different roles are in life. This passage is teaching that God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. So how I view this whole passage is, it is talking about a woman accepting her place in God's order and saying, yes, I accept that you want me to let my husband lead out. You want me to let the men be the leaders, lead in the home or whatever, and in church. And when we accept that, and we go to church or worship, which I believe this is what it's talking about, or we're um, in a setting, you know, if, if a woman's praying and prophesying, she is covering her head to show outwardly that she is accepting God's order and she is submitting um, to that order. And so whenever she takes a role, this is implying as a masculine role, say praying in public or speaking in public, um, say in church settings, I'm not talking about getting up and having a sermon, but I'm just talking about when a group gets together, I'm just talking about spiritual things, worship things where a woman stands up and is basically addressing men or um, speaking in their presence in worship. When she covers herself physically, she's saying, I am speaking out, but I'm still very much accepting my role in God's plan. That's how I view these passages and I know a lot of other people do as well. But anyway, that's the concept behind this. It's not just about putting something on your head, it's about what it symbolizes. So now I wanna move on and talk about the why. I wanna bring in kind of the role of men and women and how beautiful that can be if it's done how God wants us to do it and designed it to be. I think I'm gonna read out the NIV just because it's so much easier reading than the King James and it's easier to understand. So Ephesians 5, 22. Let's start in verse 21, actually. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and present to her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And it goes on to say, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. So when we as women read this, all we see is this glaring, submit. And we're just like, <laughs> If you happen to have grown up in a setting where this wasn't taught as it should have been taught, possibly it was really hounded on and the whole purpose of this was left out where men wrongfully take this and put it on women for their own gain, that is definitely something that is not how Christ intended it and it's something that obviously does make women retaliate and it's like, you know, you're just doing this for your own desires to have power and so on. And so if you've grown up in that type of setting where men abused this, um, then I invite you to take a fresh look at this passage, how this really should look when a man is following Christ as he completely should be. 
The part about wives submitting is actually only a very, very small part of this passage. A lot of it is actually addressed to the husbands and how they're supposed to love us. And it's a little bit in there, like women submit to your husbands, but husbands, you have to do this and this and this and this as Christ to the church. And um, so I wanna focus a little bit on the men for now, and then we'll, we'll jump back to women. And I'm gonna use my husband as an example. I love him to pieces. I admire him greatly at how his concept of the Bible, how he lives it out in his life. When I first got into a relationship with him and some of the things I did to him that were extremely hurtful and the way he loved me and forgave me through those things started giving me a bigger picture of how Christ truly loves his church. And I began to see a picture of Jesus like I never had before just through my husband's actions towards me. It's calling husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And when we look at Christ and how much he loved us, it is completely mind-blowing that he left the most perfect place and came to sinful mankind where he knew he was going to go through so much pain and agony and do all of this because he loved us so much and he wanted to, to give us an escape from our misery. He wanted to make a way that we have hope that we can have a hope above this sin-cursed earth and all the horrible atrocities that happen here. And he came, not only that we have hope for heaven in the future, but he also brought heaven to earth. So if you have Jesus living in your heart, you know exactly what this means. You can be going through so much hard times, troubles and stress, and because Jesus came and he lives in us and he made a way, he brought a piece of heaven, a joy that settles over us that helps us get through things. So he made both a way to just get through life here on earth and then also for the hope of heaven in the future. And this love, I mean, the sacrifice that he went through, I don't think any of us can quite grasp it. The calling that husbands are supposed to love us in that exact same way is a huge responsibility. We women, all people, but we women can be really hard to love sometimes. We can get so wrapped up in our feelings and our emotions and we just let everything control us and we can lash out and we can, we're really good at our tongues. Uh, most women anyway, I know obviously it's a stereotype, but we women are pretty, pretty quick to win an argument. We're sharp with the tongue. There are times we just let our feelings ride over and men are still called to love us no matter what. And that's how Christ did. He loved those that were unlovely. Also, Christ is the head of the church, right? But what did Christ do? He came and he served us. He was a leader that served. And if you read any books that talk about what makes a good leader, one of the things is serving those that are following him. And that's another thing that men are called to do in a relationship. They are called to serve their wives. He's to serve his family, to serve his wife. He's not some big king up here just, okay, you go do this for me. Now you go do this for me. That's kind of what we think of submit. No, he is there. He's the leader, he's the one that leads out the family, yet serves, serves and loves and just lays down his life every day, his own desires, because that's what he's called to do. That's what this passage is teaching. And when you can see it in that light, all the sacrifice that a man is called to do to fulfill his place in God's role, it makes it so much easier for us women to say, you know what, my husband loves me. He's looking out for my needs above his own. Yes, I would love to submit to that and to let him lead out. And even if maybe there's a big decision coming up and maybe I disagree with what he's thinking we should do. But in the end, it is our responsibility to say, this is your decision. I'm not going to fight against it. You know how I feel. And if your husband loves you, he takes every account. He takes your opinion very seriously. My husband does. He doesn't want to make any big decisions without me. We view life as a team. But in the end, someone does have to be the leader. You look at businesses, any kind of organization, there has to be someone in charge. There has to be a leader or it falls apart. It never works without a leader. The same is with the Christian family. There needs to be someone that leads. And in this case, God calls men to lead and women to follow that. And it's a very pretty picture when it's done how God intended it to be. In this kind of relationship, when you are living with a husband that is fulfilling his role, as I described, it just makes it easy and it makes such a beautiful family life. And I wanna make a disclaimer. I am so human. I fail at this all the time. There are times when I don't submit like I should have and I need to, you know, 
apologize for that and repent of it. Um, you know, if I've lashed out or just did something completely contrary to what I knew my husband wanted me to do. And I'm learning and I'm trying to grow in that. But this is what I know to do and I'm endeavoring to do. I just wanted to let you know, I don't have this mastered, I'm human. There's obviously times he acts unloving to me as I do to him. But I'm talking about a general picture here. I know I'm loved by him unconditionally and it just, it means the world. Anyway, one other quick thing I'll dive into since we're talking about husband and wife. In the last verse in 33 it says, however each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, which is a high calling. He's supposed to love me just as much as himself. And the wife must respect her husband. And I just find this so fascinating that the wife is called to respect her husband. And there's a book called Love and Respect. It's an incredible book, you should read it. It talks about man's desire for respect above love and woman's desire for love above respect. This is something that actually really bothers me that I see a lot, even in Christian circles. Women are, we operate out of love and we kind of have a mothering spirit. And so we feel because of this instinct, we feel that we can love our husbands, but maybe there's something that we do that we don't approve of and we disrespect them. And this cuts deeply to the men when we are disrespectful to them, but yet somehow we justify it in ourselves because, hey, we love them, but yet we were very disrespectful. And is that truly love? It's so easy when you get together with friends and you start making jokes about the opposite gender and he does this and he does that and it's so annoying because we women understand each other and we get together and we can get sympathy because we're like, hey, I'm going through this. And I'm not saying it's always wrong to discuss things you're going through, but I have seen so much disrespect spoken from say women about their husbands and i'm just like how can that ever contribute to a healthy marriage there has to be an honor an honor there that you don't just take the person that means the most to you is supposed to be your best friend and be there for you and just trash them to your friends or to who anyone and just make disrespectful jibing comments or even undertones of disrespect it's so easy to do back to the whole thing of mothering we women and men are so different in a lot of ways. And I kind of grew up as a tomboy, so I can relate a little bit more with men sometimes, I think, because I enjoy some of the things they do. Men in generally, I'm generally speaking, not all men, men tend to just love power, blowing things up, loud noises, all these different types of things that, that sometimes we women can look at and we're like, this is childish, this is foolishness, this is dangerous. And, and I've seen it in women, they tend to like suddenly treat their husbands as children as they're the mother to their husband. And there is something in men that I wish women actually would keep more. There's a little child inside of a man that never goes away. Like you'll see him just plop down and just love to play with toys, Legos, say build things. They'd really dive into it with the children or go out and just do something really silly off the wall that women often don't quite understand. I personally think we women need to have more of that in us, where we sometimes just let our adult responsibilities go and just go be a kid again. Just go have fun and just join in in the simple little things that bring fun in a child's life. And I'm only saying that because I see this all the time, where women don't just allow men to be men. You see in society, they're mocked, they're laughed at, they're toxic masculinity. Anyway, my challenge just is that respect your husband even if you think Whatever they enjoy going and doing is ridiculous and childish. Just let, that, let them be that little kid when they want to. Just because he likes to go out and do something simple and almost what appears as childish doesn't mean that he's not mature and has a um, good thinking sense and that type of thing. Respect them and see how far it goes. And not all men deserve respect. There's a lot that don't deserve respect. Also, back to this thing of submitting. Not all husbands are going to be treating their wives like they are called to. And that is when it becomes really difficult to submit to their leadership when they are actually coming across as a kingly form of like, I'm the king and you are going to listen to my command. Um, there's men that are that way and I can understand how that is, makes it very, very difficult for a woman. But I am just trying to portray what the Bible is calling for men, for women, and how when this is combined together, it makes for a very, very beautiful picture. Um, and so through that, I guess my challenge is respect your husband. Don't be bad mouthing him in whatever way to who no one, unless you have, I mean, obviously if you're going through some hard times 
it is good to have one person that you can confide in and just go talk about the struggles you're going through. But this thing of just openly bashing your husband to whoever and whatever and making jokes and undermining him, that really, really, really affects them and makes it harder for them to love you in the way Christ calls them to love you. And it's just a big circle. And I think if we can respect men, then they in turn will want to love us in the way that we want to be loved. And if we continue to just defeat that and do that, I believe it's how we grow and become close and can com communicate together better, love each other more, live in harmony, and be the Christian family that we're called to. One thing I wanted to mention too, while we're on the subject of this, children, let's, let's talk about children a little bit. One thing, I'm just a young parent. Obviously I haven't raised a teenager or anything like that. But just from advice from my parents and from just observing other families, I believe one of the most, absolutely most important things for a child to grow up in security and just to be a well-rounded individual, I guess, is when there is peace and love at home. When a child knows that their parents get along, their parents love each other, there's not all this fighting and bickering, um, there's not hatred, animosity, there's not this undertones of disrespect. A child feels that strongly and when they can feel the union between a husband and wife, I believe personally you can make a lot of mistakes as a parent and that umbrella of love and respect between a husband and wife will cover a lot of those tarnishes and mistakes that you make as a mom or a dad in a child's life. That's just my viewpoint. I know for myself sometimes, you know, Nolan and I can bicker and we get a little bit under each other's skin and Xander will pick up on that so quickly. You stop it, stop fighting and stop talking like that, he'll say. And sometimes we're just like jabbing each other in good fun and he will even sometimes be like sensitive to that and think we're angry at each other when we're not. We're just kind of poking each other's buttons for the fun of it. I just believe that this whole picture that God has in place, if it's blended like it's supposed to, it creates a secure, loving family life like family was intended to be. All right, so I just said all of that to just kind of give a picture of what I believe God's calling is for the Christian family. Um, for women in relation to men, how we submit ourselves under them, and then that whole picture is why I wear this, is to show that I am in subjection to my husband, try to be, <laughs> and to, to um, those other men in leadership. There's so much responsibility that falls onto a man's shoulder in leading out. He is responsible to make sure that he is teaching God's truth and not some kind of twisted version of the Bible or a false teaching. And he is called to lead out his family. And all this responsibility lays on his shoulders. And God holds him to a higher standard and is going to hold him responsible for his family. And that is a serious, serious responsibility to take on. It's not a light thing. This isn't some kind of glorious, oh, I get to be king for a day. No, it's, it's serious. And I think we need to keep that in mind that men have a large responsibility. There is a verse in 1 Peter 3. In verse 7, it says, this is King James again, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. He's talking about the wife. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel which modern day feminists hate to hear, <laughs> and being heirs together of the grace of life. This kind of gives me the picture of a team. Um, that your prayers be not hindered. It shows the, this, the sol solemnity, the responsibility put onto men and how they're supposed to honor us and love us and take care of us as women. I don't care what society says as far as how independent we women can be. Most of us women as a whole, there's something in us that loves that story of the knight in shining armor coming and rescuing the damsel in distress. There's a reason those stories have been <laughs> hits throughout the centuries is because men love to rescue and protect and be the heroes. And women love to have someone that wants to protect them. That's kind of off topic here, but just speaking of the weaker vessel thing. Anyway, but that your prayers be not hindered. This is saying here, this is so important for men to make sure that they fulfill what they're supposed to do. And if they don't, their prayers and their connection to God is going to be hindered. They have to be in the place that God wants them to be. 
and that's serious. And so I just wanted to bring that aspect in as far as men as well. And I'm focusing on men's responsibility here, but I think sometimes it's easy to just say, hey, we just need to submit. And we forget what man is actually called to do. And in a lot of ways, it's a lot, a lot harder for him than for us. And that's just kind of why I wanted to focus on that instead of just submit, submit, submit. My heart really goes out to women that are in relationships with men that do not fulfill their place like they should be, that are abusing their power. Because um, it is very difficult to submit to a person like that. And so my heart goes out to you if you are in one of those relationships. But I do challenge you to continue to follow God's plan and continuing to respect your husband even when it's hard and continuing to... Um, you know, reverence God and say, I'm willing to be in the place that you called me to be. First Peter 3, 1, wives in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When Nolan and I get on this subject, he often tells me that women have no idea how much power they hold with a man that he believes women have more insight in many situations than men do and have a way of influencing people that men do not have. I believe this to be true as I've seen this in life and also when we look into many biblical stories. Women have so often been key to either the building up or the tearing down of a man. So it's something that we need to hold with great care and is a reason we are created to be a helpmate for our husbands. We can do great things when we understand our value and our God-given role and don't step out of that to try to take matters into our own hands. In the verse I just read, we can see that simply by our actions and a God-like spirit where we respect our husbands even when they are completely undeserving, that they will take note and often are drawn to God in the process simply through our actions. I did want to talk a little bit more yet about society and this whole wave of whatever you call it third feminism wave <laughs> in society today and how society's pressure can definitely like get into your mindset just little bits and pieces and it can be very toxic and it's something that we have to be careful with so feminism what do i think of it well obviously i am all for equality for women's rights i'm definitely for women being able to be educated you know, there's a lot of countries where this still isn't possible where women can um, you know, have jobs, equal paying jobs as men, why I still believe a woman's place is in the home, at all, if at all possible, and to stay home and take care of her family. I do know there's some situations where women have to provide and take care of their families and those types of things. And in some countries, that is very difficult simply because they don't have the opportunities that men do, is what I'm saying. So there's definitely lots of parts that I am completely in agreement with. However, it's gotten completely out of hand and instead of turning into something where women have rights, it is now turning into men hating, bashing, masculine, whatever, toxic society. It's against everything that God has in place. It's against the Christian home. It's against the Christian family. Some of this stuff can kind of leak into our mindsets as well, and we can be influenced by them. And I'm just cautioning us not to let society make us another copy of them because it's God's word we need to align ourselves with, not what some people think, because hey, in today's society, no one knows what truth is anymore. Anyway, truth is irrelevant. It's so sad. And so are we going to let a society where they can no longer just say absolutes? This is science, this is true, this is false. They can't hardly even say that because it might hurt someone's feelings. Um, are we going to let them dictate how we feel? No, we can't. We have to have an anchor. And that anchors God's word. That is truth. Jesus is truth. We always align ourselves with him. Anyway, back to society. I just feel so sorry for men nowadays. And women are desperately trying to make men more feminine while they are trying themselves to make themselves more masculine. And it's just so ironic to me. I have seen um, videos where a woman, women would not admit that men are genetically stronger than women as a whole, as an average men just tend to be stronger than women. And this feminism movement has gone so far that some women can't even admit to that. They have completely lost sight of what equality is. Equality means you're valued the same, but it doesn't mean you are the same. Your value as a human is the same. You, you should get the same types of opportunities and various things, obviously. But there's just some things men are going to be better at, some things women are going to be better at. And it's these differences that complement each other. We don't want to all be the same. I don't want to be in a world full of women. That would just be boring. 
And if we make all men like women, like how awful would that be? And it's not like all men have to be masculine as far as the term goes. I'm not trying to say that, but to go after men and say, this is toxic, it's wrong. Men have been designed to be heroes, to be conquerors, to be protectors. And that all goes with masculinity. And this whole movement just is against everything men are. I feel sorry for them. And I just pray it doesn't come into our Christian circles. What I've been talking about with men being leaders and women being subjection goes in absolute contradiction with feminism and they just will seethe at that type of mentality. But in all reality, it is a beautiful picture that just makes things work. And we just look at society around us and we can see how well things are working out there. <laughs> I would much rather be in line with God's plan and have a beautiful blessed life, even though sometimes it's not easy. It's not always easy being submissive. I think I could do this job better than my husband. And it's true, there's a lot of wives that can do some things better than their husbands, but um, that's part of our calling is to let them lead out, to be their helper, and to be the one behind them. So I wanted to end on one more note, bringing everything back in full circle and coming back to this practice of head covering. Just take these viewpoints as my husband and I, I know that there's some people that wouldn't really agree with me in, Mennonite, in the Mennonite circles. This is something that is a bit of a burden for Nolan and I and different people that we know as well. One thing about something as distinct as the headship covering, we as humans, we can put a lot of value in external things. It's so much easier in life to have a checklist of things, of things to do and things not to do. And so when it comes to Christianity, it's so nice to have boxes that we can check off. Oh, I didn't lie today, I didn't cheat today, I must be okay, you know, that type of thing. That's not how it works. It's, it's a heart issue. Yes, all these external things matter and our actions matter. They show what's, what's inside. But if we focus on the action and not on the heart, we have it all mixed around and it won't work. And so it makes it difficult. The Bible says that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And it's just by walking in tune with God that we can weed out the things and get to know like what we need to change. From a human perspective, it's so much easier to have a checklist of things to do and not to do. And the headship covering is one of those that some Mennonite circles have almost put this on a pedestal above salvation. And I'm just going to put it right out there and that's not right. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that Mennonites have everything all figured out. Um, there's flaws in our groups as well. It's a group of people I love being a part of and I feel they are doing their best to walk closely, as closely to scripture as we know how. And I love being a part of this group. And I just wanted to, to bring that out that I think we need to have a good balanced perspective of the woman's headship covering because there are definitely groups. You, you have salvation here and the, the woman's covering is like right under that, almost like a deciding factor in whether she is saved or not. And that's where I'm going to separate my husband and I's beliefs from Mennonite culture because I'm not speaking for Mennonites. Um, and I understand the value in this. I personally believe it's what a Christian woman should do is cover her head. Um, however, I do understand also, this is one passage in the Bible, one passage, and it's in a letter that Paul wrote to, Corinthian, to the Corinthian church. And it's one of those practices I believe is a huge blessing and something a Christian woman should do. However, my husband and I don't believe this is something that is a salvation issue. Now for, I will quickly clarify, to me, I feel it would be. Like, I just personally do not feel I could stop doing this because to me, this is what God is calling me to do. And I believe it's what God is calling Christian women to do. However, I don't view other people as they don't cover their heads, so obviously they can't be saved. And that can be a mentality in the Mennonite circles, especially the more conservative churches. Either, you know, they're not the Christian they need to be, or they haven't come quite to the true light of this verse yet, or that type of mentality. And it would be my desire that all Christian women would obviously um, cover their heads and look into this passage. So I just wanted to point that out, that this is something valued very, very highly in our cultures. It's something that I treasure, that this has been taught and valued the way it has. But it's also, I just wanted to give a little bit of a light that sometimes if you come across any people like this, I apologize for them if they come across in a judgmental way, basically implying that you can't really be a true Christian 
if you're not doing it as we are doing. Um, and I'm still, you know, I'm still finding my way through some of that. But um, salvation is in, in Jesus Christ completely alone. And we as a Mennonite culture have put such an emphasis on this because it's one thing that makes us distinctly different from many other Christian circles and Christian groups, but plus various other things that we do. But it's one of the external things that really stands out. I highly value this practice, but I think we need to be careful on where we put it in relation of to salvation, I guess. It's such a fine line. I believe that if you feel God is calling you to do it, that you definitely should, and it could, it could be something that could get in between you and God. But I don't believe that just because you put something on your head suddenly makes you more righteous than someone else. It's all about the why behind it, and it's all about the teaching and the passage and all the things we talked about, the why we do it. And yeah, so that's kind of all I'm going to say. So I just wanted to differentiate between some of the things I say. There's definitely Mennonite groups that would, might not quite appreciate that. So I just wanted to separate myself from that and not make everyone believe that what my husband and I said in that area, that it could be something other groups wouldn't agree with. All right, so if you made it to the end of the video, congratulations, that was a long one. I'd love to hear your comments and your thoughts and your perspectives on this passage. I love healthy conversations where two people can sit down, even if they have two differing viewpoints, and healthily discuss things. I probably won't be doing a lot of debating or talking in, in the description, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Anyway, that was a long, long video. We'll see you guys in the next one. Be blessed. Always keep looking up to God and aligning yourself with His Word and not with societies. Cheers.